Welcome back to Let's Both Play Resident Evil 5. I'm Burning Dog Face. I'm Ronan Drake, and I can't see anything. Yes, unfortunately, thanks to our history of connection issues, Drake does not have the uh, last two files in this library, among others. So today, in this final lore video, we're going to learn about... Xella Gioni and her friend Albert Wesker. First up, the head of Tricell. Or a head of Tricell. The Gione family. Three. Oh yeah, you're right. She was the uh, head of one of the branches, wasn't she? Well, I guess we're right to find out. The Gioni family is well known and respected throughout Europe for their successful export-import business. Her grandmother, being from the Travis family, the founders of Tricell, has in, uh, endowed Excella with quite a noble and storied lineage. Blessed with model-like beauty and raised in such an aristocratic family has led to her being haughty towards those around her, especially men. I hadn't noticed. But it was neither Excella's looks or family background that got her to where she is today. Gifted with a keen intellect and inheriting her father's business acumen, uh, Excella quickly breezed through school and enrolled at a university at a young age. There I she made... Fam yeah, family probably helped her get to be head of a corporation, but... Yeah, yeah. There she majored in genetic engineering, and her talents are recognized by her grandmother's family. With her connections, she was able to enter Tricell's pharmaceutical division at the age of 18. Okay, maybe, uh better for the position than I thought. Although she was a gifted member of Tricell's founding family, she was still a Gione, an offshoot of the famed Travis family. Even with all the research teams at Tricell's disposal, she was only given one. Excella viewed this act as a slight. Of course she did. While still feeling indignant over this affront, she was approached by Albert Wesker. Wesker's interest in Excella was piqued by her intelligence and character. It was at this time he provided her with all the information he, he had concerning the T-Virus and other research. Oops. Excella was now armed with the tools to make the advances to her career that she desired. She used the information and technology she obtained from Wesker to advance Tricell's bioweapons division exponentially. Hmm. In a fortunate turn for Tricell, Umbrella, who had previously dominated the bioweapons market, had gone bankrupt, greatly increasing Tricell's sway in this area. Thanks to Excella's efforts in expanding Tricell's market share, she was given more of a voice within the company. Before long, she was making key decisions that would affect the fortunes of the pharmaceutical division. This was precisely as Wesker had intended. Excella then set her sights on the position of CEO of the Tricell Africa Division. Her adroit use of flattery and intimidation soon landed her that powerful position. She seems like a bit of a cliché, but alright. You know, I, I... I get haughty, I get, you know... You know, posh and whatnot. Smart wasn't something I got from her position in the story. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I just kind of thought she was just bankrolling everything. Yeah. Uh, it is now believed that it was Wesker who suggested Excella take over Tricell Africa. He exploited her romantic interest in him, and was able to use both her and Tricell Africa to further his Ouroboros plan. Excella's first order of business as Tricell Africa's CEO was to restore the abandoned Umbrella Africa research facility. As the facility where research on the progenitor virus had been carried out, its use in the completion of the Ouroboros plan was vital. Following the facility's restoration, Ricardo Irving was employed to sell bioweapons in order to secure funding for the research being carried out on the Ouroboros virus. As the Ouroboros plan ne neared completion, Ixella began to fancy herself as the queen in the New World Order that would follow the plan's execution. Unfortunately for her, those dreams those dreams was dashed when the man that was to be her king injected her with the Ouroboros virus. And that's where the file ends. 
Hmm. I suppose it makes sense that there's not much there on her. As you said before we started recording, she was only in the one game. And, uh, yeah, definitely not coming back for anything else. I mean, even a, a something set before this just wouldn't have anything to do with her. Uh, up next, file number 12, Albert Wesker. The Mansion Incident. The Tragedy at Raccoon City. Rockfort Island. Umbrella's Antarctic Research Facility. And the Umbrella... C Remember, I forget how to say this. Caucasus? Caucasus? Mm. Whatever. The Umbrella Research Facility in Russia. Uh, let me see. The kidnapping of the U.S. President's daughter. One man was involved either directly or indirectly with each and every one of these incidents. Albert Wesker. The motivation behind all of Wesker's actions can be found in this current incident in Africa. Wesker had already obtained samples of various organisms and viruses, including the T-Virus, the G-Virus, the T-Veronica virus, and Las Plagas. All of these were eagerly and enthusiastically received by Umbrella's former rival companies, who compensated him greatly for each. With wealth, power, and glory, Wesker appeared to have everything a person could ever want. Wesker, however, was not interested in material gains. Hmm. An all too familiar. Like, Sorry, say that. As it's, it's just because it seemed like they're. Like everyone else is kind of getting a life story, and here it's like, and we'll just pick up from where you last saw Wesker. Yeah, I mean, I suppose he'd been featured pretty prominently at this point. You know, they had those, uh, the no like previously on Resident Evil that seems to go further into his history than anyone else's. It seems like it's going further into his history than this. <laughs> um, yeah, I was kind of expecting something about, they suggested he was genetically engineered, like from the get-go. Yeah, they yeah, that growing up in a in a laboratory, Wesker grew to hate the world or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, an all-too-familiar sense of trepidation continued to gnaw at him, the source of this uneasiness being Umbrella's founder, Oswell E. Spencer. During his time at Umbrella, Wesker could never ascertain what Spencer's true intentions were. Spencer's extensive funding of B.O.W. research was unheard of in the field. The whole reason for producing bioweapons was that it could be done relatively inexpensively and combined with a normal weapons delivery system. Spencer's extreme investment in B.O.W.s seemed unnecessary. Why would Spencer need such B.O.W.s in the first place? To find the answer to that question, Wesker joined Umbrella's Information Department. Even after the downfall of Umbrella, these doubts continued to haunt Wesker. To find the answers he needed, Wesker began to search out Spencer. The only problem was that even before Umbrella's dissolution, Spencer had removed himself from Umbrella's day-to-day -day operations. Wesker had to use every resource at his disposal, all his time, money, and connections. Oh, it's a period. That's where that sentence ends. Uh, eventually, he ascertained Spencer's long-hidden whereabouts. On the first night of autumn... This is, this is getting... This is getting into, like, prose now. On the first night of autumn, as thunder and lightning raged in the skies above, Wesker arrived at the ancient castle in Europe where Spencer resided. Wesker expected the old man to be surprised by his presence, but instead the withered old eyes of Spencer lit up with dark delight as he spoke. You're back. The words barely audible amidst his cough-racked laugh. If once, if Wesker had his doubts about Spencer before, he didn't know what to make of him now. He only knew at that moment that the seemingly feeble old man had been in control of everything that had transpired at Umbrella. Even Wesker's own actions through the years had been controlled and manipulated by this decrepit old man. With this sudden realization, Wesker knew, uh, now knew that the source... Oh! Sorry, Wesker knew... Third time's the charm. <laughs> Wesker now knew the source of his anxiety for all those years. 
Appearing to read Wesker's thoughts, Spencer laid out everything to him. The development of bio-organic weapons was only a means of achieving his true goal, the forced evolution of mankind via viruses. It would be the end of the current form of humanity and the birth of a new, superior human race. Zombies. <laughs> with this new race, he would build his utopia, with himself as a god on Earth. In order to realize this dream, he required three things. One, the progenitor virus. Without this key component, his dreams would no be no more than abstract ideas. Once he discovered the progenitor virus, he had the foundation on which all his subsequent plans would be built. 2. The Umbrella Corporation The manufacture of bioweapons was the perfect method of conducting his research on the progenitor virus. Any profits gained through Umbrella's research were secondary to his true goal. The third thing Spencer needed in his grand vision was Wesker himself. Spencer knew what was required from his utopia. He also knew he would need a new human race. But what would that new breed of humans be like? The progenitor virus would spur natural selection upon the population. That was the fundamental premise behind Spencer's plan. But if the new breed of humans brought about by the selection process were unwilling to share in his vision, then there would be unwanted complications. Which is a hell of a light way of putting it. You know, War of the Superman over here. Yeah. This forced stage of evolution would give the surviving humans increased, increased strength and intelligence, but it would not affect a person's knowledge, logic, or general character. If any indolent or unsavory individuals survived to be a part of this new race, it would be a blight on Spencer's utopia. Now, let me just make sure. This is Wesker's backstory, right? <laughs> and the file says Albert Wesker. That's all I can tell you. All right. This is definitely more about Spencer so far. Kind of disappointed. Uh, Spencer was not about to have his vision stained, so he enacted a plan to ensure that that would not happen. This plan was called the Wesker Plan, which is named after the chief researcher at the time. According to this plan, hundreds of children born of parents of superior intellect from all nationalities would be collected. Oh. Oh dear. If their knowledge, logic, and self-will could not be altered by genetic manipulation, then Spencer himself would instill his values into these children by whatever means he deemed necessary. These children were all given the surname Wesker, and after completion of their indoctrination slash manipulation, they were placed into select controlled environments in various locations around the world, ever under Umbrella's watchful eye. Oh, shit. The children themselves were to be kept unaware they were being monitored. With Umbrella's concealed aid, they all received the best educations available in the fields they pursued. After a few years, one child who showed particular promise was sent to Umbrella's training facility in Raccoon City. This Wesker child's name was Albert. Spencer was quite pleased quite pleased by all of Albert's actions, and if the other Wesker children were like him, Spencer would have nothing but quality individuals for his new race of humanity. Spencer then enacted the second phase of his plan. All the Wesker children would be administered an experimental virus. Hmm. It this took a while, but it's about Wesker. Pardon? I said it took a while, but now it's about Wesker. Yep. Lots of them, apparently. This virus was administer administered to screen out the more gifted of the Wesker children. Some took the virus on the recommendation of a friend, others were given the virus as part of their medical treatment, still other had it forcibly administered to them. Sounds about right for Umbrella, to be honest. Yep. Uh, Albert Wesker was no different. His partner, William Birkin, gave him the experimental virus and he administered it to himself. This screening process turned out to be a little too selective. Most of the Wesker children died, leaving only a few survivors. Albert Wesker is one of those survivors, and he disappeared shortly after. 
Spencer was unconcerned by this development. There was a failsafe device attached to every Wesker. Spencer's existence. This was the discomfort Albert had felt through his life, or throughout his life. All Wesker children were programmed to seek Spencer out, which manifested itself as a growing anxiety within each of the sus of subjects. Just as Spencer had predicted, Albert soon came to him. Unfortunately, Spencer had made one miscalculation. His failsafe only worked for as long as it remained a mystery. As soon as the mystery was revealed, Wesker no longer had a need to restrain himself. All that was impeding Wesker was a feeble old man on death's doorstep. The right to be a god. That right is now mine. With these words, Wesker broke from the shackles that Spencer had laid on him. It was only random chance that brought his former subordinates Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine to Spencer's mansion at that exact time. But Wesker took it as a sign. The weak would always resist the will of the chosen. With renewed purpose, Wesker reflected on his own evolution and the evolution of the human race. After the incident at the Spencer estate, he went underground and used the news of his death to veil his activities. He had achieved his goal of obtaining the virus and capital he needed from his position at Umbrella. Next, he put all his efforts into bringing his Ouroboros plan to fruition, and thereby setting himself up as a god over the new generation of humanity. And so we come to the end of the uh, informative files of Resident Evil 5. All right. I'm Burning Dog Face. I'm Ronan Drake. And we'll see you next time on Let's Both Play Resident Evil 5 when we get into the Lost in Nightmares DLC. Hooray. Later.